Alright, welcome back. It's another adventure of an angry guy does some practice questions with you on YouTube. Today, we are using the 2019 release items from 30-2. And you can see that once again, I have a split screen going on because we would have two booklets. And uh, we have sources to unpack and we have questions to consider. And how many questions do we have? That's a that's a that's a burning question. We don't have that many. We have like 22 questions. So I might be able to do this all in one take. Yes, that is exciting. So let's do one take. Let's promise this would be one take. Um, I would always say, like, let's look at source one. Look how long that is. Let's let's begin with this the question then. I think a strong test taking technique is to read the question first and then when you look at the source you have purpose behind why you're looking at the source so reading the question first it reads government officials would most likely justify allowing the agencies mentioned in the source so now i'm going to have to look at the source and figure out what agencies are mentioned to use cell phone jammers by arguing that in a democracy Police surveillance is necessary to control the actions of opposition parties. So in a democracy, police surveillance is necessary to control the, the political parties that are not in power. Does that make sense? Does that make sense that in Canada, the liberals are currently in power federally and uh, the conservatives are not? So then the, the liberals jam the cell phones of the conservatives um, because that's important in a democracy? I mean, maybe the liberals are doing that. Um, but it would be scandalous if they are. The ability of the media to criticize government actions is suppressed. Again, I haven't read the source yet, but like in a democracy, you wouldn't expect the media to be suppressed. You'd see that in, a, in an authoritarian state. The need to protect the common good may override civil liberties. We have seen that during um, you know, crisis. Um, in order to protect the common good, the War Measures Act was used in 1970. In order to protect the common good, we've used the Emergencies uh, Act um, because of the chaos created by the trucker convoy in the United States to protect the common good. They invoked the USA Patriot Act. Dissent against unpopular government agencies is discouraged. Well, a democracy is built upon allowing dissent. So I haven't looked at the source yet, but the only one that makes sense based upon my knowledge of the of what is a democracy is is C. That we might have at times the need to um, jam cell phones because the common good is more important than civil liberties. So now I'm going to look at the source and see if that makes sense. Um, with the ever-increasing popularity of cell phones, many businesses and educational institutions have concerns over the inappropriate use of such telecommunication devices. Cell phone jammers, which render a cell phone useless, are considered to be one solution to problems associated with cell phone use. However, cell phone jammers are illegal in Canada except for military, law enforcement, and other government agencies that ensure public safety and security. So the answer is in that sentence. That we have some agencies, and remember that idea of agencies was in the stem, the question, allowing the agencies mentioned. So the agencies being mentioned are um, military law enforcement and government agencies. So it says government officials most likely justify allowing the military, law enforcement, and other government agencies to use cell phone jammers by arguing that, well, why would the military do it? Why would the police do it? To ensure public safety and security. It's right there in that sentence, which means C. The need to protect the common good. Now, sadly, we can go back and see how many people got that one right. Um, number one, 80% uh, said C. So most people did get that right. So that's good. That is good. Number two, the reaction of the students as described in the source most strongly emphasizes the value of equality. So as long as this applies to everyone equally, we're happy. Competition, private property, collect collective action. So what value do the students have? Well, we haven't read about the students yet, so we're going to have to continue to read. Um, under the Radio Communication Act, an individual charged with using a cell phone jammer may face a fine or a one-year jail sentence 
One high school principal in BC used a cell phone jammer to prevent students from text messaging and calling during class time acts, which violate the school's cell phone policy. In protest, angry students refused to go to class and made the principal aware that cell phone jammers are illegal. The principal unplugged the jamming device and no charges were laid. The reaction of the students, they were angry, they didn't go to class, emphasizes the value of equality, competition, private property, collective action. Huh. In protest, angry students refused to go to class and made the principal aware the cell phone jammers are illegal. Now, if the principal had been seizing their phones and they said, no, I'm not going to surrender my phone, um, it might be private property. That phone is my private property. I will do with my private property as I deem fit. He's not taking the phone away. So a bit of a pull to see, but not enough. Competition. They, they emphasize competition. That would be if the students are like, you know what? Um, we're going to go to a different high school. That uh, a better high school, one that allows us to, you know, play on our phones all day. But that's that's they're, they're not going to a different high school. Equality would be how come some kids get to use their phones and, and some don't. But it was it was a, a jamming of all. What we do see is a group of students um, protesting and and acting as a group. So therefore, it's collective action. Good question. The student's reaction most clearly demonstrates the idea that the values of liberalism are not viable. Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, they, uh, they protest, um, and in the end, their protest uh, works. So I'm not sure I'm pulled to that one. Resistance to authority is encouraged by democratic governments. Well, we definitely see resistance to authority there. Citizens in a democracy use a variety of methods to bring about change. They do bring about change, don't they? They bring about the change. The, uh, the principal unplugs the jamming device, and they use a variety of methods. They refuse to go to class, and they make it aware to the principal that what he's doing is illegal. The growth of liberalism has resulted in a decreasing respect for law and order. Turns out that uh, the... The students had respect for the provincial law with regards to cell phone jammers. They did disrespect school law with regards to cell phone use. Um, so a little bit of pull to that. The values of liberalism are not viable. Not seeing that. Resistance to authority is encouraged by democratic governments. They're not being told by their state, by their government, hey, you go out there and you fight against the principal. Students in democracy use a variety of methods. You know, that's the key to the message here, that you know, they protested, they refused to go to class, they made the principal aware, and change happens. So the answer is going to be C. But in order to get to C, I had to really um, you know, think about the connections between a few of them and the source. And although more than one of them had a connection to the source, it was more clearly the connection about C. We can't really say for sure that the students um, disrespect law and order because of the growth of liberalism. But we can say for sure that they used different methods and change happened. So that's why C is better than D. Let's look at 4 and 5. Information in the excerpt indicates that First Nation delegates assembled with the goal of something. So what I need to do here is read the passage and try to find out you know what goal are they assembling with is it creating a common voice in an effort to improve living conditions and I always pause and, and I think okay well, what what's that gonna look like and if I can only have one thing bouncing around at one time maybe I go back and I, and I look for evidence that that's what it is about raising money from private charities to fundraise on reservations Creating a common voice in an effort to improve living conditions, raising money to fund organizations. Similar but different responses. 
selecting a government agent that would be responsible for dividing up Indian lands, recommending how the federal government should assume control of services provided on reservations. So all similar socioeconomic things happening in A, B, C, and D, but there are some subtle differences. A, I might highlight if I had a, a paper copy, common voice, living conditions. B, I might highlight raising money, um, fund organizations. C, I might highlight you know, selecting agent, um, divvying up lands. D, recommending um, control of services. The first general meeting of the Indian Association of Alberta and bears special mention for it was the first time in the history of indigenous peoples because the language has been updated of the West that the Cree um, from so many different reserves marched into formal enemy territory to unite with the southern tribes in a common cause. Okay, right. the first general meeting we have the Cree from so many different reserves marching into former enemy territory to unite under a common cause. Uniting under a common cause. There's a bit of a pull to A there, right? Creating a common voice, but why are they uniting? If they're uniting to improve living conditions, then we know the answer is A. The convention was held at Camp Hector, west of Calgary, where 140 delegates attended a two-day conference. All reserves in Alberta were represented by delegates, with the exception of the Blackfoot. These people joined the association at a later date. The conference got underway at 9 a.m. Okay, so there's some information there about the, the, the length of the conference hasn't helped me understand what is the agenda, right? All the proceedings of the conference were carried out under parliamentary procedure. Uh, no interpreters were called for since the meeting was conducted in our common adopted language, the English tongue. Uh, among the many resolutions presented was a unanimous request for a complete revision of the Indian education system. Okay. Treaties had guaranteed educational facilities, but terribly inaccurate, inadequate support had been given financially, throwing most of the burden upon charitable minded people. Hmm. Hmm. Information in the excerpt indicates that the First Nations delegates assembled there with what is the goal? So lots of lots of other information there, right? You know, this is where it's held, this is when it's held, this is the proceedings and, and how it's being held. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to underline some key things here on, on my photocopy that's, you know, out of camera and seeing if I can maybe identify on the page here something a little bit more clear. Um, yeah. Huh. All the proceedings carry out parliamentary. No interpreters are called for. Among the many resolutions presented was unanimous request for complete revision of the education system. Treaties had guaranteed educational facilities, but terrible inadequate support had uh, been given financially, throwing most of the burden upon charitable-minded people. So we have the common voice, but do we have improved living conditions? If one assumes education and the quality of education being provided is one aspect of a living condition and the fact that the living condition, those educational systems uh, weren't as strong as they should have been, not as, as uh, supported as they needed to be, then there's a big pull to A. B, raise, B, raising money from private charities to fund organizations. Um, is there anything in here about how we're, we're going to try to raise money? It says that, you know, throwing most of the burden upon charitable-minded people. So there is a pull to that language there. But it's not saying that that's what we want to do. What they're trying to do is improve the education system, but they're not saying we're going to do it by raising money in, in private charities. It, the opposite is actually being suggested that too much burden has been uh, put upon charitable-minded people. 
selecting a government agent that would be responsible for dividing up lands. Um, you know, it, it's talking more about schools than lands. Recommending how the federal government should assume control of services provided. Assume control of education. That might be a service provided. They assembled with the goal of recommending how the federal government should take control over education. Is that what we're getting? Or is it about how we improve the living condition? All the proceedings called for carried out a parliamentary procedure. Uh, among the many resolutions presented was a unanimous request for complete revision of the system, uh, the education system. Uh, treaties had guaranteed uh, educational facilities but terribly inadequate support had been given. So they're not saying government should assume control. The treaties had already guaranteed educational facilities. The issue was that they're not being funded. So their effort is to improve living conditions by improving those educational facilities. Then the goal is A. So I'm not going to go with D because of that treaties had guaranteed educational facilities had already taken care of who should assume control over the, per the services. I'm not going to pick B because they're saying that charitable people have already had too much burden. They don't want to burden charitable people more by, by raising money uh, from local charities. And there's no connection to land here. It's talking more about uh, education, which is an extension of living conditions. So we're going to go A. Sometimes they, they take a little longer, right? Sometimes they take a little longer, but um, that's okay. Uh, number five. The information in the excerpt, same excerpt, could best be used to answer which of the following research questions. These can sometimes be puzzling questions. So in, in order to understand this idea of what is a research question, you might say, you know, what is the theme of, of this passage? To what extent have First Nations engaged in conflict with each other? I mean, it does talk about how they're going into traditional um, former enemy territory. But that's not the, the main theme here. The main theme is living conditions and education and funding and stuff like that. To what extent should the Canadian government repress democratic freedoms? It doesn't talk about that at all. It does talk about parliamentary procedure, but no other thing about democratic freedoms is mentioned. To what extent should the Canadian government respect groups exercising collective rights? Is this a group exercising a collective right? Well, in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we have a section on collective rights for Canada's Indigenous peoples and our First Nations have collective rights and they are exercising them as they come together to to have a common voice and to demand a certain um, certain um, a, you know response from government. To what extent have First Nation communities been affected by residential school system? And, and that's a topic we study um, greatly um, and it is a topic connection to education uh, but residential schools are not mentioned, and the legacies of residential schools are not mentioned in the source. So for number five, you have to cross off the things that, that aren't mentioned. D's not mentioned. Democratic freedoms, B's not mentioned. To what extent have First Nations engaged in conflict with each other? It's mentioned, but just as a, a framework of establishing the precedent of all of these voices coming together. So really it's about, you know, how should the government respond to this this new voice coming from Canada's First Nations um, that are, you know, looking at the need for uh, more funding? Number six. Ooh, okay, quite the little cartoon there. Um, the cartoonist is critical of government policies that promote economic equality in society, that inadequately support national security that implements stimulus packages to circulate wealth that contributed or contribute to reduce funding for public programs so then I look at the cartoon and I see at the top education and the school looks like it's in disrepair a uh, health care the person looks unhealthy they have an accent in in their for their eyes environment and the I don't know maybe it's fall but the tree is not meant to look healthy I guess and social emergency services, um, the vehicle seems to be maybe inoperable. So you could make the inference that um, the four uh, public programs listed at the top need some attention. 
and instead the money is flowing away from them towards tax cuts to the rich and the Iraq war. So the cartoonist is critical that money is flowing away from the top towards the bottom. So the cartoonist is critical of government policies that contribute to reduce funding for these guys. The answer is D. Oh, that's nice. If it was um, implement stimulus packages to circulate wealth, then the money would have to somehow circle back, right? But the money's only flowing down. It doesn't return. Um, inadequately support national security. Well, it's not saying that the, the military is not getting enough money. There's this argument that maybe we're spending too much money on the military's uh, campaign in Iraq. Um, and this is probably an American cartoon then. And then promote economic equality in society. Cartoonists are critical governments that promote economic equality. What we're seeing here is economic inequality. The tax cuts to the rich are benefiting them. And we can, we can assume that the poor uh, don't have that much wealth, right? So it's, it's critical of a lack of equality. It's critical of too much money going to the military. So it's arguing the opposite of what those options are. So it has to be D. Critics of the situation depicted in the cartoon, money flowing to the rich and, well, tax cuts to the rich and money going to the military, would most likely demand that the government raise interest rates. Well, raise taxes, maybe. Cut spending on the military, maybe. Um, increase spending on these guys, maybe. But raising interest rates, we can't say for sure that's going to solve it. Reduce transfer payments. Um, apply progressive taxation. Provide subsidies for business. So in order to get number seven right, we need to know what progressive taxation means. It means that the more you make income tax wise, the more taxes you pay. So if you make um, uh, more than you'll have these brackets and then as you go from one bracket to another, the percentage of taxes on your income will go up maybe from 25 to 33 to 40 percent. And um, being that this is arguing against tax cuts to the rich, the opposite would be progressive taxation. So C's our answer. Number eight. In the 1970s, the American government viewed the relationship represented on the stamp. Pause, look at the relationship. It's the Soviet Union and Cuba becoming friends. Um, as an endorsement to the movement towards economic globalization, a signal to the United States the Cold War was ending, a gesture of goodwill towards the international community, a threat. Um, the United States saw the relationship between the Soviet Union and Cuba as a threat, hence the blockade, hence the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, hence the, the long-term uh, sanctions against Cuba. Cuba was 90 miles off the Florida, the F Florida coast, and they saw it as, uh, as a possible threat to the Western Hemisphere. Um, and that's, that's D. So D is a recall question, but you have to know um, how the United States responded to the relationship between Castro and the USSR. Number nine. The situation depicted on the stamp was a contributing factor in the strained relationship between the superpowers. Well, definitely, if you consider the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, things became strained. Now, they were already strained, right? Um, but it, it helps to uh, increase the tension, you know, Perhaps the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was you know, one of the most heated times during the Cold War. Uh, factor in the success of international peacekeeping? No. Rejection of the goal of maintaining series of influence? Rejection of the goal. The situation depicted on the, on the stamp was a contributing factor in the rejection of the goal of maintaining series of influence. If anything, um, because the... the the Soviets had this, this new um, area within the American sphere of influence. It made the Americans even more dedicated to ensuring that their sphere of influence um, was as safe as possible. Reduction of, of international aggression between the superpowers. Um, that's a tough one because not initially, but following the Cuban Missile Crisis, we do have detente, which you know a student might be pulled to D because of it. But... The situation depicted on the stamp led first to A, and then after A, it becomes D. Um, the Cuban stamp shows Brezhnev and Fidel Castro, and, and the relationship is this Cuba becoming a part of the Soviet sphere of influence. 
Cuba becoming part of the Soviet sphere of influence contributed to a strained relationship. Number 10. According to the information in the four graphs, okay, lots of math to deal with here. Holy, that's, uh, I'm going to want to know what I'm looking at before I try to look at all that. Um, which of the following countries received the most Canadian foreign aid? Huh. So I just have to figure out who's getting the aid. Is it Iraq, Haiti, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan? So top five recipients of uh, aid from the CD, CIDC, CIDA. Sorry. Um, well, do we just add these numbers up? Like Yugoslavia, China? We were given aid to China in 2000. Bangladesh, Indonesia, India. <laughs> Iraq, Haiti, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. So Bangladesh, among those, has 39 million. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Bangladesh. So now we got to add 66 to Bangladesh. Um, Iraq is at 115. Haiti's not even on the map yet. Afghanistan's 99. So right now, Iraq has the most money going to it, even though Bangladesh is mentioned twice. Um, Afghanistan, holy smokes, 178. And then here, Afghanistan, 230. So we're going to end up getting the answer um, by doing the math. So you're going to have to, you know, maybe have a blank piece of paper. You're going to have to have somewhere to crunch the numbers. And, and see, you know, in the end, which of the following countries received the most foreign aid? Um, and it should be as simple as just adding it up. Hmm. So based on that, you know, I'm looking, just trying to see if I can get some some, some numbers being played around here. Um, So Afghanistan has 230 and 178, so that's you know about 430, 500, a little bit over 500, um, 600. So Afghanistan's at 600. Iraq 115. Not mentioned. Not mentioned. Really? So Iraq's out of the picture. Uh, Haiti. Ninety-two, two fifty. So that's like three fifty, but that's less. Uh, Bangladesh, sixty-four, sixty-six, thirty-nine. So about one hundred fifty. So it's got to be. It's got to be Afghanistan, and that kind of fits into what we'd expect, being that we were engaged in a war in Afghanistan, and a part of that was nation building. So that took a little longer than I'd want, but. Um, you know, if you just take the time to add up the numbers, then the answer should be on the page. A laissez-faire economist, Adam Smith, uh, would most likely view the actions of the CIDA illustrated by the graphs with, so the actions are, we're giving money, right? We're giving money, disapproval or approval, and why? So what does a laissez-faire economist want? They want freedom from government, right? So what we have here is government involving themselves in, in redirecting money. So it's probably going to be disapproval. Um, why, though? Because people should rely upon themselves or because political systems of many recipient countries are undemocratic? Well, a capitalist probably would like democracy, um, but not necessarily, right? But a capitalist does definitely want people to be self-reliant. So even though capitalists probably are also pro-democratic, 
we can say with certainty that capitalists want people to be self-reliant. So the answer is going to be A. The information presented in all four graphs suggests that the CIDA has been increasing its commitment to improving living conditions. Seems to be throwing money all over the world. Encouraging free trade. Well, with these um, aid packages, is there the agenda that, that they have to embrace free trade? Um, that's not on... That's, that's not listed on, on the maps or on the graphs. Promoting that democracy or delivering aid more evenly? Well, we know it's not evenly because some are getting more than others. But we are seeing that they're committed to trying to help countries from a variety of places in the world. So we're going to go with A. 13. Voting no on this uh, ballot questions may be seen as undemocratic because doing so would imply that um, are you in favor of lowering the, the voting age to 16? So if you vote no, you want to keep the voting age at 18. So voting no on this ballot may be seen as undemocratic because you're implying that people that are 16 aren't capable of voting, right? That the use of referendums to gain political support from minority groups is inappropriate? Mm, nope. Decision-making based upon the views of seniors? Well, we're talking about not seniors in high school, right? We're, we're, we're not talking about senior citizens. We're talking about maybe, you know, people in grade 10 and 11. Discrimination against a portion of society on the basis of age is appropriate. So if you vote no, you're discriminating on people that are 16 and saying it's appropriate, right? Which is undemocratic, so the answer is C. Individuals who do vote no would most clearly prefer that the current election electoral system Maintain existing practices of decision making within society. Undergo significant change. No, they don't want change. Be reformed, be replaced. Am I overthinking this or am I underthinking this? If you vote no on this, you're basically saying, no, I don't want to change the electoral system. The only one that says that is A. So I'm going to go A. Wow, another long source. Lucky me. A supporter of liberalism would most likely see the anti-war protests. So a supporter of liberalism, how would they see anti-war protests? If I like political social liberalism, democracy, I would see protests as good because we want dissent. We want a variety of opinions, right? So acceptable because men would resist being forced into fighting for a cause they opposed, or... Acceptable because the goals of the civil rights movement would be advanced. Huh. Could be both, right? Could be both. So a supporter of liberalism, democracy, would likely see the anti-war protest described as this is great because the goals of the civil rights movement will be advanced. Or this is great because now men who don't want to go to war don't have to go to war. Well... It is an anti-war protest and not a civil rights protest. So I'm beginning to think about D, but I might have to read it. In the 60s, the United States was a decade when the right to free speech was embraced by the individuals or groups wanting change. Two such movements involved the anti-war protests who spoke out against the American presence in Vietnam and the women's liberation movement who sought equal rights for women in society. Opposition to American involvement in Vietnam uh, spread amongst college and university activists who felt that the United States had no right to be involved in the affairs of Vietnam. They felt this way despite the government's fear that the communist ideological practices of North Vietnam would spread to include South Vietnam. It became popular for young men who were drafted into the armed forces to burn their cards. The sentence there says the answer is D because they're resisting being forced into a war that they opposed. They're drafted into, drafting is conscription, and they're being forced to go to war. The poster in Source 2. Oh, there's a poster. Like their sisters in the West, they wouldn't burn their bras? This was on an exam? If there were any in the shops. Museum of Communism. Like their sisters in the West... They would have burnt their burnt their bras, but there were no bras in the shops. 
Wow, I've never seen that source before. Um, okay, so it's saying that the women in the Eastern Bloc, they would have burnt their bras just like American women, but they didn't have bras because the stores didn't have any because the government was promoting guns over butter. Well, that's an interesting little source. I think I'm going to use this source in the future. The poster in Source 2 is critical of the fact that communist countries often lacked consumer goods. Hey, they would have burnt their bras if they had some, but they don't have any bras. So they can't burn them. If there were any in the shops, it gives me the answer to be A. Huh. I kind of want to go back and see how many people had that one right. I'm just going to look at the key for a second. So 16. I want to see how many people had it as A. Man, this takes a little while. 16. Oh. So the next most likely answer was C with 20%. What was C? Freedom of speech. If it was C, then then the, the, the source would have had to say, like their sisters in the West, they would have burnt their bras if they were allowed to speak or you know, if they were given a chance to protest. But it doesn't say that. It says if there were any in the shops, and that's why it's A. That, it's a that's a unique source. Which of the following generalizations is most directly related to the actions of the women in source one? Then we, gotta, we have to go back. We didn't read about the actions of women in one. And the message in two. So the message in two is, you know, burn your bras. The actions of women in one. At the same time, feminist viewpoints were given new life through the women's liberation movement by stage protests addressing issues of gender inequality and discrimination against women. In one such demonstration, women protested against the Miss America beauty pageant by throwing their bras, high-heeled shoes, false eyelashes, and other items thought to be instruments of torture into a trash can. Journalists at the time compared this action to that of men burning their draft cards. And although no bra burning was ever publicly reported, an urban legend was born. Ah, oh, okay. So this happens, and then the idea that people were burning bras, uh, that legend was born, and then and then this happens. Okay. So which of the following generalizations most directly related to the actions of the women in Source 1 and the message in, in 2? Improvements in labor safety were initiated by powerful women? Is it talking about jobs? Is, is it talking about working? The women's liberation movement was aided by collective action? Huh. There's that word collective action again. You know, are they working as a collective? Are they, are they, are they like, is there a demonstration? See how um, here in one such demonstration, women protested against the Miss America pageant. So as a group, they did this, right? So there is collective action happening. Um, public protests for reform were ineffective in granting women equal rights. Doesn't talk about the effectiveness here. It was so effective that, you know, this protest here inspires this source. The women's liberation movement left gender roles in the workforce unchanged. Wow. They were trying to create change. The only thing that draws me to the answer is this idea of collective action. There's collective action here. There's not a huge pull about um, workforce. I, I don't see the term workforce in here at all. Right? I mean, they're talking about social um, values and social norms, um, which bleeds into the workforce, but they're, they're, not, they're not specifically focused on the workforce. So I'm going to go B. Individuals who demand a new society as quickly as possible are radicals. Radicals are a little more extreme than liberals. No sources left. Oh, okay. I can close that. So radicals are a little more extreme than liberals. And um, that's why the answer might be that. Oh, now I've lost everything. Well, I guess I shouldn't have changed. Now I'm really showing my ineptness. Like, where did everything go? All right, so 
people that want lots of change, the radicals. Um, what a radical idea would have been for me to maybe just not. Why is he so bad with technology? So individuals who demand a new society as quickly as possible. Well, this is a recall question from the beginning of the course. Reactionaries want a return to an old society. Conservatives want the status quo, so they want to stay as it is. Liberals and radicals both want a new society, but radicals are more driven to achieve that now and use violence if necessary to achieve it, so the answer is going to be B. Fascist political leaders organized rallies. So Hitler had a rally to encourage individual responsibility, weaken citizen participation, reduce economic disparities, further national goals. Well, I'm going to get rid of C. You know, Hitler's not trying to reduce economic disparity, right? He is, is not really concerned about the goal of equality. Communist leaders were concerned about that. Um, weaken citizen participation. He definitely doesn't want citizens participating in free and open elections, but the, the mass rally gives the illusion of participation. That's why we, we call them controlled participation. Encourage individual responsibility. Encourage individual responsibility to Hitler, to the Fuhrer, maybe. Fascist leaders organize rallies to, these are my goals. He's going to, what, what, what's done at the rallies? He's going to say, this, this is what we're up to. These are, these are our plans. These are our policies. And he's going to inspire in his followers this, this fervor, this love, this, this patriotic devotion to helping those goals become a reality. D is the answer. In a democracy, which of the following citizen actions would be considered inappropriate? So, in Canada, in the United States, what wouldn't you see? Establishing a new political party with the intention of removing the government. Isn't that the intention of all parties, is to become government? If that's not your intention, federal NDP, then what are you up to? Um, your goal as a federal party should be to remove the government, um, unless you are the government. Uh, organizing a demonstration in front of government buildings to protest government actions. No, we, we do that. I mean, the truckers got sent home because um, Trudeau felt threatened by the Freedom Convoy, and, and maybe the demonstration went a little long, but... Uh, Organizing a demonstration to protest government actions is your political right. You have the freedom of, of expression. You have the freedom of speech. You have the right to petition your government. You have the right to assemble and demand change and, and to question policies. That's the whole idea of the will of the people. Write a letter to the editor, expose the dangers of cooperating with the government. Well, happens all the time if anybody reads newspapers. Prevent a government member from attending a vote. So there's going to be a, a controversial vote and like I kidnap my MP, I kidnap my MLA, or I block the door so they can't go in. Yet that would be seen as inappropriate. We're almost done, thankfully. Um, which of the following citizen actions is an example of civil disobedience? Key term, civil disobedience. Gathering near a government building to demonstrate against a proposed bill. Civil disobedience, I had have to be disobeying a law. Am I disobeying a law if I gather outside a government building? Only if there's some kind of law in place that says I can't gather in public places. And generally, we have the freedom of, of assembly, so I'm going to go no on A. Continuing a political protest after authorities have issued its dismissal. So authorities have said stop doing this, and I'm still doing it, then... I'm disobeying their direction. Sounds like B. Campaigning for a reduction in subsidies provided to disabled people. Is there anything illegal about my campaign? Is there anything disobeying about my campaign? Um, if not, then it can't be that. Exposing government corruption. Uh, that is literally your right to do that. So the answer is going to be B. And I believe we have, what, two questions left. 22. 
Uh, by implementing a form policy of containment, so they often ask about containment on these tests. It's like it's the only thing that happened in the Cold War, right? Um, by implementing a foreign policy containment in the early years of the Cold War, the United States was de demonstrating its determination to pursue the goals of detente. Detain detainment, or containment, sorry. Containment, I'm going to stop the spread of communism. Truman Doctrine, we will not allow totalitarian regimes to be imposed upon free people. Domino Theory, if they start falling, we'll start falling in eventually. So, um, because we're going to confront the Soviets and stop the spread of, of communism, we're going to have peace? A? Come on. It's not A. Demonstrating its determination to stop the expansion of communism. B is literally the definition of containment. It's got to be B. Prevent the return of, of fascism. We're going to stop the spread of communism because we're afraid of fascism coming back. Support the collective security efforts of the UN. No, containment is connected to communism. With which of the following statements would a collectivist most likely agree? The common good is best served when there is private ownership of resources. Page 71 to 85 of the 30-1 textbook that we use in 30-2 lists the, the principles and values of individualism and collectivism. One of the values of collectivism is common good. Common good is best served when private ownership of resources. Common good from a collectivist point of view is common good is best served from public ownership, right? They would want public property. So you almost had me at A because you used the word common good. Tricky, tricky. But, but the idea of common good coming through private ownership would be the essence of, of capitalism, which is the opposite of collectivism. So I'm tired and I almost had that one wrong because I didn't really think about all the key language. Productivity is maximized when individuals are motivated by personal profit. The invisible hand, that's capitalism. Competition serves to benefit society, that's capitalism. So A, B, and C are all about economic individualism, capitalism. Wealth should be distributed equitably. Hmm. So wealth should be distributed you know, fairly, right? Equitably. Um, the sharing of wealth is a collectivist. That, my friends, is D. And that's the end of this one. we got another one coming up. It's a little bit longer, so we're going to break that one into two parts. Um, yeah, I don't know if I helped you at all doing this. I helped myself because by doing these, I, I better understand how um, the assessment branch of Albert Ed creates these questions for our Dash 2. There are some key terms like collectivism, that came up, containment came up, detente came up. So one thing that you can do with these released items is go through it and, and see if you understand key terms like civil disobedience, um, subsidies. It is a test of language, right? Um, words like disparity, citizen participation, all four of those spots on a spectrum. So it is nice to check in and say, what is the key building blocks, the key language of the course? Economic equality, key case studies, civil rights movement, um, words like referendum. So it gives you a chance, proportional representation, even though it wasn't the answer, it tells you this is something I need to know about. What does it mean? So as you work through these, you might even be looking through them and saying, you know, do I know enough about the term common good that keeps coming up? Do I know enough about the difference between democratic and undemocratic? Do I know enough about um, the ideas of a sphere of influence? Um, or, you know, going back to the word globalization from grade 10. Do I know enough, uh, do I know enough about progressive taxation, subsidies again? Stimulus packages and connecting to Keynesian economics, maybe. Public programs, connecting with modern liberalism. Do I know enough about collective and individual rights, about residential schools? So another layer of learning from the test is to look at the questions and see based upon the language being used, are you familiar with the values of liberalism as opposed to the values of non-liberalism? Things like these terms came up a lot. So, 
thanks for watching I'm sure I'm gonna get wow maybe double digits in terms of views here you know maybe get 10 and uh, for those rare few of you that ever see this hopefully it helps see you next time